dollar, dollar, dollar. Dirt and money, no soul. Had to go and get it, ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't declare me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long, get my team strong. Let me run away from my problems. Yo, let's get original crew. It's your boy DJ Nuki, your girl. Sierra Nicole. We're back with another Mr. Ballin' video for y'all today, man. We got This Boss Will Kill You. Yo, we got requested to do this a while ago. And uh, hey, we finally got it, man. Yep. We finally got it. Uh, I know we always say spam us up in the comments uh, with the next video y'all think we should react to. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically how we do things, just, just to give y'all a spill. Yep. We do a shorter version during the week. Mm -hmm. We do the longer versions on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So just to, let us know, preferably, which one would y'all like to see us do on Sundays. To, you know what I'm saying? We want to take y'all, take in what maybe y'all want to see on Sundays. You know what I'm saying? Okay. But with that being said, man, we going to hold y'all. Make sure y'all check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go, man. If you want to first part, you got to do it. Check out down below. Also, if you enjoyed today's video, man, make sure you lock it in with a thumbs up. Please. But let's go ahead and get into it. Let's check it out. Let's see what it's about, man. It's against this boss will. You see. <laughs> Far and away, the scariest part of the story is Jason's when he brings the Dybbuk box home and he goes to bed that first night and then the following night what he sees in his living room. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, at the next solar eclipse, offer the like button a pair of children's cardboard 3D glasses and tell them that they can look directly at the solar eclipse with these on. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Kevin Manis owned an antique shop right in downtown Portland at the base of the Burnside Bridge, which is considered the gateway to the city. Because Kevin owned this antique shop, he was always at yard sales and estate sales looking to find the next thing he could sell at his shop. And so one day there was this estate sale over at this woman's house. She had just passed away. She was about 103 years old. She was a Holocaust survivor and her estate was being sold. And so he goes over to the house and he sees the way they're selling all of her items is by bundling them in different lots so depending on what item it was they'd be bundled with similar items and then sold as a package so the people there would be bidding on the whole lot they couldn't buy individual items and Kevin had his eye on one particular lot called lot 29 and lot 29 included a couple of small tools that he wanted to sell in a shop and it had this mystery box and that's exactly as it was labeled it just says mystery box on it and he was intrigued by it and so he placed a bid on lot 29 and ultimately he won the bid and he was really happy about it so he takes the contents of lot 29 and he wheels them over to his car and as he's loading stuff into the back of his car someone behind him says oh so you went with the dibbuk box huh and kevin in his head went right back to his childhood because growing up he had always been scared of Dybbuk's because a Dybbuk is a malevolent spirit in Jewish folklore and Kevin was Jewish. And so his parents used to say, oh, you better not do that, Kevin, or the Dybbuk's going to get you. And so he grew up terrified of Dybbuk's. And so, did you know about this? Uh, about the box? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm saying, oh, the Dybbuk's? I no. never heard about it. Uh, I don't know. You was looking like, oh, I know about that. I no, know. I was just like, when he explained what it was, I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, I <laughs> Oh, you better not do that, Kevin, or the Dybbuk's gonna get you. And so he grew up terrified of Dybbuk's. And so his interest is peaked. And Kevin turns around and he says, did you just call this box a Dybbuk box? And the woman's like, yeah. And my grandmother was terrified of it. And she said no one could ever open it. And Kevin turns to look at the box and it's about two foot high by one foot wide. And there are these little doors that swing open on the front. And then on the bottom, there's a drawer that comes out. And there's one lock that sits across the two doors and it's currently locked with a little padlock. And he looks up at her and he goes, why can't you open it? And the woman just says, we never knew, but our grandmother would always go 
every time we said the word Dybbuk, and so it was weird enough that we just never asked any questions and we stayed away from her Dybbuk box. Kevin agreed that was pretty weird, and he finished loading his car, shut the trunk, said bye to the woman, hopped in his car, and he drove away, and he never really gave it a second thought. At this point, he's not thinking the Dybbuk box is anything malevolent. He thinks it's just some random chest that he won at an auction. Kevin drives back to his antique shop, and he begins unloading all the things he won at the auction. He brings them inside, and he brings them downstairs because the top floor, the main floor, was really where he sold things. When he got new items, he would bring them downstairs to his warehouse of sorts, which was much bigger than the first floor, had lots of rows of shelving, and it had a, a workstation down there. He would bring his new things down there, and he would price them and get them ready before bringing them back up. And at some point, he brought the Dybbuk box in, and he brought it down, and he put it on the back table. He was about to just leave it there and go back upstairs when suddenly he became really curious, and he really wanted to open the Dybbuk box. And so he goes over and he kind of yanks on the front two doors. He doesn't want to damage it, but he can tell this lock is relatively new and it's not just going to come off. And so he doesn't have the key to it and he doesn't have a way to clip the lock. And so he takes a screwdriver and he basically wedges it underneath the actual metal clasps that are attached to the wood. And he slowly kind of bends it up and bends it off and pops it out of the wood. And as soon as he does that, the doors swing open and there's like a mechanical device inside of the Dybbuk box that activates the drawer. Basically, anytime the doors open, the drawer also opens at the same time. And Kevin remembered thinking how silly it was that this kind of old, crummy looking wine closet had this fairly complicated mechanism inside of it that still worked. Inside the Dybbuk box were two pennies from the 1920s, there was a used candle, there were two locks of hair, there was this small tombstone that said Shalom on it, and there was also a small wine goblet that was inside, and that was it. And Kevin immediately thought, well, this is just some older woman's keepsake, and these things maybe have sentimental value to her, but they don't to me. And so he shut the- I ain't gonna lie, after I saw the strands of hair and so, some of the- I'm just like, all right, this is this look like some ritual shit, and I ain't got time for it. I'm gonna go ahead and keep it pushing. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Some stuff is just- I love- and he he knew about it. See me, yeah, me see? as an individual, I would know. You would have said I would have been like, "What's this? Do you want it? You can have it. I don't need it. I just wanted the tools, and it's just with it. So you know what I'm saying? You, you can have the bus. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? After you explain to me, y'all can have it. But since you knew about it, you knew why that, you, that you know, and she told you what it was. I would have been like, no, I'm maybe y'all can keep this. This is y'all family, baby. <laughs> box, pushed it to the side of the desk, and walked upstairs and didn't give it another thought. Kevin had one employee at the antique shop. Her name was Jane. She was a younger woman. She was an incredible saleswoman, and Kevin thought very highly of her. And so the day after he had brought the Dybbuk box into the antique shop and put it downstairs on the desk, he needed to run out and do some errands, and so he put Jane in charge of the store. And so Kevin leaves, and Jane locks the front door to the shop behind Kevin because she needed to go downstairs and get a few items that she wanted to bring upstairs to sell that day and it was before opening time so front doors locked no one else is inside the shop and Jane goes down into the basement. Once you went down the wooden steps into the basement, you'd be looking out at this huge room of all these industrial shelves that run the length of the room where they would keep their antiques and other valuables on. And the lighting down there was never that great because they used these long fluorescent tube lights that at best cast a kind of subtle yellow glow on everything. They were not particularly bright and it was a real pain to actually go up and change them because you needed to place a ladder, but the ladders were not perfectly aligned with the lights. You basically had to reach over the shelving where all the antiques were, and you ran the risk of knocking things over. And so a lot of times, Jane and Kevin would wait until you were down to like one or two crappy working lights before they'd say, okay, we really gotta go up there and replace some of these bulbs. And so as it happens this day, they're down to like two or three working lights. So in classic horror movie fashion, she's going into this dingy basement with very poor lighting. And so once she gets to the bottom of the steps, she walks to the far end of the room, a little bit away from where the Dybbuk box was placed on that back table. She's in the other corner in the back of this basement and she's getting some things off the shelf when all of a sudden she stops and she can't help but shake the feeling that she feels like someone is watching her. Now, she is down in this basement 
all the time. Whether it's well lit or dark, whether Kevin is there with her or she's alone, this is a place she goes all the time. And she's never had this feeling before. There's no way to get into the basement unless you come down the stairs and she locked the front door and she was the only one who came downstairs. She hasn't heard anything. There's no other way to leave this space. So she doesn't know where she's getting this feeling from, but she really can't shake it. And as she's kind of looking around and she's starting to get a little bit paranoid, the phone rings. They had a landline that was on a table right at the base of the stairs. The phone rings down there and it startles her. And then it kind of jumps her back into reality. And she's like, okay, I'm getting paranoid. And she walks over and she picks up the phone and it's actually her friend who was planning on coming by the antique shop that day. So as they're chatting, Jane hears what sounds like a broom. Imagine if a, a push broom is lined up against the wall and then it falls over the sound that the wooden stick would make as it hits concrete. Mm -hmm. That's the sound she hears as she's on the phone and it startles her again. And she goes, Hey, let me call you back. She hangs up on her friend and she's looking out and because the lighting is terrible from where she is, she's now at the foot of the stairs looking down all these rows and she's heard that stick land on the ground on the far side back where she had been originally. She's kind of looking around and she can't see anything. And so she takes a deep breath and she begins walking down the rows to see what fell over. And as she's walking down the row, something smashes behind her and she turns around and one of the fluorescent tube lights has fallen from the ceiling and smashed onto the ground. And so all of a sudden she doesn't want to explore this falling broom that's behind her in the dark corner of the basement. And Child, if that ain't no up sign to say, get the I would have got up through the stairs so quick, baby, and shut that door. I would have been outside on the Bruh, sidewalk waiting for look. This a, this a get your ass up. I am not. I, I, I would have unlocked the door way to uh, oh boy That's what get I'm back. Saying. I would have been like, hey, I'm just, uh, what are you doing out here? Just wait for you to get back. Just, just, <laughs> I, I just, um, uh, just, 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 uh, just feeling the love, you know. No, nah, no, nah, just, just try to, try to. I will, you know what? I'm happy to see you. <laughs> Bro, no. And she's ready to leave. And so she starts walking back towards the stairs to get out of here. And as she's walking down one of these rows, a wooden chair that is on one of the shelves comes flying off of it and lands no squarely in the middle, blocking her path. And there's no way this could have happened unless someone pushed this chair. And suddenly she thinks, someone's down here with me. And she screams and she hurdles the chair and she runs to the steps. She starts running up and to her horror, there's a metal door that locks the basement at night. So if someone were to break in, it's another layer to protect the store from thieves. And it was shut and locked. It can only be locked from the outside and with a key. So there's no way she would have done this by accident. And now she's freaking out because she's trapped in the basement with some person running around pushing chairs over and breaking lights. And so she grabs the gate and she starts shaking it and she's yelling for Kevin, thinking maybe he came in and forgot I was down here and shut and locked the gate. And she's checking over her shoulder, looking down into the basement and she starts hearing more lights falling off the ceiling and shattering on the ground. She is in absolute panic mode. She's just waiting for someone to come bounding up the stairs towards her. She has no idea what to do. She pulls out her phone and she calls Kevin. Meanwhile, Kevin is making his way back to the antique shop. He's only a couple minutes away and he sees his phone ringing that was sitting on the passenger seat and he picks it up and it's Jane and he answers and immediately Jane is hysterical and she's screaming that someone's in the antique shop that's breaking things and Kevin's like, slow down, slow down, what's going on? And all he can hear in the background is the sound of what sounds like glass shattering and things falling and breaking. And he's like, wait, what's going on? Are you okay, Jane? Like, where are you? And he hears her say, someone's in the basement. And he goes, well, where are you? And she's like, I'm in the basement. And he was like, get out of the basement, call the police. But as he's trying to get her to do that, the phone cuts out. Kevin was only about a block away from his shop. So he floors it to his shop. He parks outside and he's thinking to himself, what am I walking into? Is there going to be like an active burglary going oh on? Is she going to be held hostage? Like are the police going to be there? But he just knows he needs to get in there to Jane and he gets to the front door and it's locked. So he unlocks the front door and he goes inside and it's silent. And he's looking around, there's no damage to the first floor, there's no damage anywhere. And he yells for Jane, there's no answer from Jane. And he starts walking kind of tentatively through the store towards the back. And he gets to that door leading down into the basement, the same one that Jane couldn't open when she ran up the stairs to get out of the basement. And he looks at it and Jane's not at the top of the stairs anymore. And he's thinking, I didn't lock that door and I'm the only one with the key to lock that door. How is it locked right now? Does Jane have a key that I don't know about? And why would she lock it? Does that mean Jane's up here somewhere? Is that what oh happened? And he's like, Jane, come out. Did you lock this door? 
but Jane's not on the first floor and their first floor is very small. And so he thinks, okay, she has to be downstairs. And so he opens up the gate, he swings it open and he starts walking down the steps and he's really cautious as he's going down because again, he has no idea what he's walking into. He hits the lights, but the lights don't work down there. And as he starts to bend around the corner where he can actually see into the basement, he sees Jane sitting at the chair right next to that table where that phone is. And she's just sitting there kind of stunned. And he goes to Jane and he's like, what happened down here? And he glances out quickly at all the rows and he sees all this furniture that's come off the shelves and there's glass all over the ground and he's looking at Jane and Jane's just showing no reaction oh. she's sitting there like she's in shock and he turns to Jane again and he says come on you got to tell me what happened down here and Jane just goes I, I don't know I don't know how to explain what happened down here I was walking down the row and then I felt like someone was watching me and then things are falling off the ceiling and the shelves I've never seen anything like this before. Now at this point, Kevin's adrenaline is through the roof. He came charging in here thinking he was gonna have to save Jane from some person breaking in and breaking stuff. But as far as he can tell, there's no one here but Jane. And so he decides he's gonna take a flashlight and he's gonna explore the basement because either there's someone here or Jane did this. So he grabs his flashlight and he starts walking around and all he sees is a bunch of broken glass and some furniture that's come off the shelves and a couple other things that are on the ground. But other than that, there's no one down here and there's no other way to come in or out of here besides the stairs. So after Kevin is certain that no one else is here, he turns to Jane and he regrets this now. He says in an interview that he feels horrible about this now, but at the time he's thinking to himself, you know, this had to have been Jane. Who else would have done this? I don't know why she did this, but there's no one else here. And he goes, Jane, did you do this? And this is when Jane's emotions came through because before she was in shock, now she's mad. And she goes, F you, Kevin. And she leaves and she doesn't say another word to him and she doesn't come back. She quits on the spot. But at the wow. time, Kevin believed she had done it. So he was kind of like, oh well. He was not even a little bit thinking the Dybbuk box had anything to do with this. Just a couple of days after the- I, I don't blame her though. I'm like, Jane, yeah, I'm I gonna, don't blame her. Cause I would, I would have, I would have hit you with that too. Like you gonna blame me? Why would I do that? Why, like why would I do that? Like I have no reason to be breaking glass and lock myself down here. And then, you know what why, I'm saying? Kevin, why would why, I lock why, myself down? You didn't call the police. Like, you could have called 911 while you was speeding home. And told the police, I mean, it's, it's not home, but to the... Uh, to the antique shop. Yeah, to the shop. And then you could have been on the, on the phone with the police the whole time. I would have just said, I, I, I would have oh, called I, it back. And another thing with businesses, at all times, there should always be more than one individual at any business. There should never be somebody there by themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There should always... You know what I'm saying? Unless you strap like that one dude, you know what I'm saying, with the knife. The folks thought he was going to come uh, rob him. And an exit as well. Like, if that's the uh, only yeah, way yeah, to, yeah. like, come the front door you should and always have just multiple the exits. Like, you know, that's just... Especially with a basement. Child. Well, yeah, well, there should be a... Some basements have an a exit door. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you still, yeah. Even a little bit thinking the Dybbuk box had anything to do with this. Just a couple of days after the basement incident, Kevin's mother was supposed to come by the antique shop and the two of them were going to leave and get lunch together to celebrate her birthday. As soon as she walked into the shop, Kevin goes, hey mom, I got a gift for you. And he brings over this wrapped box and he sets it down on a table right in front of his mother who's sitting on a chair. And he unwraps it and it's the Dybbuk box. Before Kevin can explain what it is, the phone rings at the other end of the store and he was expecting a call and he goes, hold on mom, I got a get this. And he goes to the back of the store to answer the call while his mom is just sitting there looking at the box. And so while Kevin is at the other end of the store, his mother opens the Dybbuk box and she says she had to sit down as soon as she opened it because she had this unbelievable, overwhelming sense of dread as soon as the doors were open. And she's staring at it like she can't take her eyes away. And then all of a sudden she has a massive stroke. And so she keels over and she can't move and she can't talk. And Kevin sees this happening. He runs over and he's like, mom, what's going on? He calls 911. And as the paramedics are working on her, she would say that while she was in this kind of paralyzed state when she couldn't talk and she couldn't move, all she wanted to communicate was to somehow get her son to get rid of that box. Mm -hmm. She didn't know why, but she felt like the box had something to do with her having the stroke. And so all she could do was move her eyes. And so she found herself, because her son's right here, 
Looking at the Dybbuk box, then looking away. Looking at the Dybbuk box, looking away. Hoping her son would see her eyes as a signal to look at the Dybbuk box and put it together that that thing's bad. And Kevin does realize that his mom is flicking her eyes at the Dybbuk box, but in the moment, he's much more concerned about the health of his mother. And it wasn't until she got put in a hospital and she was being taken care of and he knew she'd be okay, that he remembers, he kind of went over it in his head later that day, that his mom was really scared looking and she was looking at the Dybbuk box, like that was the thing that was causing her to be scared. Not the stroke, the Dybbuk box. And Kevin starts thinking to himself, I don't know, there's something off about the Dybbuk box. Either it's really bad luck, or there's some truth to you don't open up this Dybbuk box. Either way, I don't want to take any more chances because so long as I've owned this thing, I've had a horrible thing happen in the basement and now my mom's had a stroke. So I want to get rid of it. So Kevin puts the Dybbuk box at the front of his antique store and he puts it up for sale. And very quickly, a young couple came into the store and they bought the Dybbuk box. And Kevin's relieved. He's like, thank goodness that bad luck charm that whatever's going on with that thing is gone and out of my life. But just a couple of days later, he was in the back of the shop when he heard the door open and then the door shut and he walked out expecting to see some customers, but instead he sees the Dybbuk box that's sitting <laughs> right inside his store. Someone must have just dropped it off. And so he walks. The mom said, nope. And my thing is, like, what do you do with things like that? You open the box, you know what I'm saying? You know that there's maybe some type of correlation to it having some type of bad luck. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. I wouldn't give it to nobody how else, to but how do I it. get rid of it? I'll give it back to the original. Because I wouldn't want to get that bad like you said, to nobody back, else. Give it back to the original. Owner. I'm like, look. She did put it in her grave with us. <laughs> I don't no, know. No, but for all jokes aside, though, for real, though, like, how um, do you, like, like, it's like you can't undo it. You're the one that opened it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Well, no. It's anybody who has access to it. Not the one that opened it. Because, obviously, the couple had it. And they probably have, experienced something and took and, 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 and just, associated it to that and took it right back. And just said, we got to take this back. Maybe so. Maybe so. Take, Maybe and they, whoever, don't even, they ain't want the money back. They just wanted to they give just it back to, to give it back. So, whoever is in possession of it. Mm-hmm. Ciao. Mm-mm. To it, and he sees there's a piece of paper that's been taped to the top of the Dybbuk box, and there's writing on it. And all it says is, this has an odd darkness about it. Wee. This really freaked Kevin out, because in a way, it was like other people were confirming that something mm -hmm. was wrong with this box. Kevin did not want the Dybbuk box to be in his store, so he put it in his car, and he drove back to his house, and he put it in his storage locker, and he locked it up, and then went back to work for the day. That night, when he went home, he went to bed, and he had this dream. Where in the dream, he's walking in this courtyard and he's holding the hand of this woman who he believes is his friend and he trusts this person and the area he's in feels very friendly and it's a very positive dream. And as he's walking, all of a sudden, this person starts to pull away from him and he can't move anymore and he's, he's losing the grip on this person's hand. And they keep moving and moving until their hand is out of his and they disappear into the corner of the courtyard where it's totally dark. And so he's looking into the darkness, waiting for his friend to come out again and he he can't move, he's anchored to the spot, and as he's looking, he sees what looks like an old woman walking out of the mist, and her head is down, and he can't tell what she's doing, and she's pretty far away, and she's walking closer and closer to him, and when she's about five, six feet away, she raises her head up, and her whole face is falling off, all the skin is falling off of her face, it's rotting, she's like a corpse, and she raises her hands up in front of her, and then she grabs his face and begins pulling off pieces of his face until he suddenly wakes up. Kevin had to compose himself in bed because he was so scared from the dream he just had. He sits up and he goes into the bathroom to get a sip of water. And as he walks past the mirror, he notices there are marks on his shoulders and his arms that he did not have before. It looks like bruising almost. And he's looking at them and he's thinking, no way. That, that has nothing to do with the dream. This is just coincidence that, you know, she was grabbing me in this area in the dream and now I have marks there. It's just coincidence. And so he kind of writes it off and he goes back to bed and he has the same dream. He gets up again and he's, he's breathing heavily, he's sweating because he just had the same dream. It was this terrifying dream and he goes back into the bathroom and now his entire back is 
covered in bruises. He has bruises all over his back, all over his arms. He's got red marks on his neck. And now in his mind, he feels like it has to do with the Dybbuk box. The Dybbuk box is now in my backyard. It's not a coincidence that all of a sudden I'm having these horrific dreams that are apparently manifesting themselves in bruises and marks on my actual body. And so Kevin is done with the Dybbuk box. And instead of going back to bed, he goes to his computer and he puts the Dybbuk box on eBay up for sale. And that night, two college kids named Sam and Brian who lived in Missouri, they buy the Dybbuk box and Kevin could not be happier to package that thing up and ship it off. Sam and Brian had seen the ad on eBay for the Dybbuk box and at first it did not seem remarkable, but they saw that Kevin had given this really detailed description of all the strange things that had happened for him since he owned the Dybbuk box. And I think clearly Kevin's angle was he was almost trying to advertise it to groups of people that might be interested in that. And Sam and Brian were exactly that demographic because they were looking for things online that were considered haunted. They wanted to see if ghosts and the paranormal were real. And so they were eager to buy the Dybbuk box. And Baby. Bro, hey, I, I, I'll say this, I'll say this. At least he gave them a description. Because I was go I was about to get mad. I was like, I'm tired of you trying to sell it, pun this thing off on other people. I was about to, but, but then he gave, but he, he gave, gave the details and they into that stuff and they looking for stuff so, like that and they So if anything like, happens to you, so, it ain't my fault. You asked for it. So, and people don't be don't be thinking like Stop playing with these spirits and stuff, cause that stuff is real. I don't know why people like. Bruh, I'm just I, saying, like, 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 he had to get rid of it. I said eBay in my head. I'm like eBay. <laughs> I'm like, hey, like what? But I said this cause I was like, that's trifling though. They all way in Missouri, you in Oregon. What they gonna do? Return the sender? Yeah, I don't you put my no, no information. It's a mysterious. I'll take it to uh, FedEx or whatever. This is the location where y'all need to mail it back to. Bruh. If y'all need to mail it back, mail it back to them. Don't mail it back to me. Mail it back to them. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I ain't no way I'm finna get this thing back ever again, bro. What Not, you saying? Bro, once you get rid of it, you gotta get rid get of rid it. Get rid of it. But I, but at the end of the day, at least he informed y'all. He did. He put a detailed description of what, what was y'all are on. buying. So and if that's anything what they was happened, into. so anything that's happened, that is on you now, not on me. I got clear but conscience dang. and karma. Mm mm. I just cannot. I can't fathom it. <laughs> it out. And so three weeks later, when this package finally arrives in Missouri at their house, Brian was still out at class, but Sam was home. So he receives the package. He eagerly brings it into the kitchen. He unpackages it and he sets it on the kitchen table. And just a few minutes later, Brian comes home and Brian would say in interviews that when he walked in, it smelled like someone had peed all over the apartment. Like there was urine everywhere. And he's walking around thinking, what happened? This smells so bad in here. And he walks into the kitchen where it was the strongest smell. And and there's Sam proudly standing next to this awful looking chest, which was of course the Dybbuk box. And he realizes, Brian does, that the Dybbuk box is what smells like urine. And he goes, Sam, do you smell that? And Sam's like, yeah, that's the smell of ghosts. Sam would pick it up and go, ooh, to Brian as soon as he walked into the kitchen. And Sam joked about how he couldn't wait to sleep in the same bed as the Dybbuk box. They were just making a big joke out of it. Sam had also set up a blog where he was gonna document everything that happened from day one of receiving this Dybbuk box to whenever they got rid of it or till whenever something happened. And for the first two weeks they had the Dybbuk box in their possession, nothing did happen. But when Sam started bringing the Dybbuk box out and leaving it right in the middle of these huge parties they would throw, where people were spilling beer on it and they were opening it up and putting things inside of it and making jokes with it, when they were doing that to the Dybbuk box, suddenly they started seeing a pretty significant uptick in strangeness inside of their house. It started with their technology. Sam's laptop crashed and the hard drive was unrecoverable, so he had to replace his laptop. All of their watches just didn't work while they were in the house. No matter what they did, no matter when they fixed it, the watch just simply did not work. Their Xbox would not turn on, but when they brought it to another person's house, it worked just fine. It just couldn't work inside of their house. And the toaster, anytime you turned it on, it basically immediately incinerated whatever you put inside of it. But none of these technological difficulties were frightening to Sam or Brian. They were just frustrating. And I don't even think they were connecting them with the Dybbuk box. It was just this thing that was happening happening to them. It wasn't until the light bulbs in their house started bursting in the middle of the night that they started to get pretty creeped out about some of the things that were happening in their apartment. That now all of a sudden it did seem like, you know, maybe if the Dybbuk box really is cursed, 
this might be how it would manifest. And so they'd replace the light bulb and then sure enough it would burst again. And they couldn't keep light bulbs in because they kept popping and so their house was dark a lot of the time. But the worst part was when they had this massive insect infestation inside of their apartment. And they were really localized around the Dybbuk box. All these insects would come out of the walls, out of the toilets, out of the sink. They'd come from behind the fridge and they would all kind of like converge on the Dybbuk box and go inside of it. The Dybbuk box at one point was swarming with insects all over and they had to shut the door. They couldn't even go in the room with the Dybbuk box because it was just covered in insects. But despite how scary this was for the boys, they had become kind of like a cool talking point on campus because of Sam's blog that a lot of other students were following. And so the boys kind of liked the clout they got with that and they decided they didn't want to get rid of the box after all. But it wasn't long after the insect infestation that Sam began losing all of his hair. And at the same time, he started having this constant hallucination that there was an old woman in his peripheral vision on either side of his head, pretty much at all times. Anywhere he went, there basically was someone he couldn't quite see following him around. Whether he was well rested, whether he was totally exhausted, it didn't matter. He always saw this shrouded dark figure that he believed was an old woman and it scared him so much he couldn't sleep and so he began going into Brian's room and sitting on Brian's bed because it was the one place he felt a little bit of comfort and as he's sitting on the bed he would see these dark figures standing on either side of him all night. And so finally, no matter how cool their blog was, it became too much and they decide we have to get rid of the Dybbuk box. And so they put it on eBay and very quickly it gets sold to a guy named Jason, who was this museum director over at this other university in Missouri. And he had actually been following along with Sam's blog. He was very interested in what was going on with the Dybbuk box. And when it was listed for sale, he was all over it. He wanted to buy it. So the boys eagerly- Chill. Just passing the shit around. Chill. Bro. Just pass, pass it. So my whole my whole mindset thought is, what happens to the people that previously owned it? Do they are they still in spirit? Because sometimes, See, yeah, you, sometimes you, ne you never but... know. Like so, I'm like, is anything happening to the previous owners, or do you all need to put another lock on the on, on the it box to like... so it can trap whatever's involved in? Because that's how the the uh, older woman had it. She had a padlock on it so whatever inside cannot escape because y'all just gotta freely open open to open the close open the close mm -hmm. but if you put a padlock on i don't know shit yeah. weird bro ship off the dipic box and jason receives it in the middle of a work day so he puts the package in his truck and he goes upstairs and he works for the day and then afterwards when everyone's left the office he goes downstairs gets the package brings it back up to his office puts it on his desk and he cuts open the packaging. Jason decided he wanted to evaluate the Dybbuk box the way he would evaluate any other antique or item that was coming into the museum that he was the director of. And so Jason starts by taking a whole bunch of pictures all around the outside of the Dybbuk box. And then he gets his black light out and he begins scanning around the outside and he finds all these traces of wax all over the outside, which leads him to believe this was probably used in some sort of ritual. And then he takes a deep breath and he sits down right in front of the Dybbuk box and he pops off the lock and gets ready and he opens the doors and the drawer slides out with that whole mechanical device. It all kind of comes open and Jason's totally let down because nothing happens. And part of him thought like, if this thing is haunted, as soon as you open it up, the haunting's going to begin and nothing happened. And he's pretty let down about it. And so ultimately after staring at it and looking at the pennies that are in there and the, the, the Shalom statue and the locks of hair, He's just kind of let down by it and he decides, okay, I kind of got my hopes up for something. This was clearly a hoax. There's nothing going on here. It's just, just a random old chest. And so he closes it up and he puts it on another desk that wasn't the one that he worked at, but was just kind of a, another table inside of this office that he shared with some other people. And he figured it would be a good talking point to tell his colleagues about and it would be kind of like a showpiece. So the next day his colleagues come in and he explains what a Dybbuk box is and the history around it that it's supposed to be haunted and you know it makes people sick and gives people strokes and you know there's been insects that have been known to come out of it and go into it. It's this very creepy thing and his colleagues are like wow that's pretty cool but they don't think much of it until all of the electronics inside of their office start to fail. 
namely their computers start crashing and their IT department comes up and they're like, we don't know why this is happening, but sorry, we can't recover it. And the light bulbs kept going out to the point where they went out and got this huge pack of extra light bulbs to replace the light bulbs as they went out. Something they never had to do before, but all of a sudden the Dybbuk box is in the room and the light bulbs are going out left and right. And then finally, Jason's coworkers that share that space with the Dybbuk box, they all got sick and they blamed the Dybbuk box. They said, you know what? We were fine until that thing came in here. Now all of a sudden our computers don't work, the lights don't work and we're getting sick. Get rid of it, Jason. So that day after work, Jason goes and takes the Dybbuk box, puts it in the back of his truck and his truck had a cover on the back. So he secures it in the back, he drives home and he doesn't want to bring it inside because it just seemed weird to bring a cursed object inside that his coworkers just made him get out of their space because it was making them sick and it was ruining their things. So he thinks, okay, I'll leave it in my truck overnight and I'll figure out what I'm gonna do with it Tomorrow. He goes inside, he says hi to his family, and before long it's time for bed and Jason goes to sleep. In order to understand what happened to Jason, you need to understand the layout of his house. When you open the front door, you walk inside and there's a wall on your right hand side, that's the side of the house, and you walk forward about five or six feet and on your left is a staircase that goes up to the second floor. If you walk up that staircase, straight ahead of you is going to be a bathroom. If you go left and walk down the hall another five or six feet, you come to the master suite where Jason and his wife would sleep. If you walk through that door, there is a wall on your left where there's a big bay window that looks out onto the street. And there's a big street light that sits right outside that projects very orangey yellow light into their room at night. Even though they have a shade up, it's this orange glow that comes through this window right here on this side. And then on the other side of the room is the bed. And the bed is situated where the feet are pointed towards this window over here and the head of the bed is against this wall. And it's centered on this wall here. And Jason, if you were looking overhead at the top of this bed, Jason's on the left side. So he's the farthest into his room and his wife is the closest into the room. So that night, Jason goes to bed and he falls asleep. Just a couple hours later, he wakes up suddenly and he can't move his body. He can only move his eyes. He's laying on his back and the light from the street light is very strong. It's this orangey glow in their whole room. And he's laying there trying to move his hands and his legs, but he can't do it. And as he's doing that, he starts hearing footsteps out on the stairs and they're distinctive sounds, slow, plus plodding steps all the way up to the second floor. And Jason's laying here with his eyes looking towards the door because his door is open and he can barely see into the second floor landing. And he's waiting to see who came up the stairs. And his heart's racing and he's looking. And out of the corner of his eye, he sees what looks like a dark figure begin to walk into the room. And his heart starts racing even faster when he can tell it's definitely not someone he knows. It's this woman, this older woman with a shawl over her head and her head is tucked down so he can't see her. And this is all out of the corner of his eye and because of the orange hue coming in from the window, he can definitely tell that there is a real solid figure right there. This is not in his imagination, it's right there. And this woman begins shuffling her way across the foot of the bed and right at the foot of the bed, as Jason's looking at her, she turns and looks directly at him. And then she runs around the corner and she looks down at him and she takes her fingers and she drives them into his eyes. And Jason thinks it's real and he's screaming in pain and he wakes up and his wife is grabbing him and she's like, Jason, Jason, what's wrong? And he's like, what's going on? And she says, honey, it's just a bad dream. You're fine. And he's shaken up, you know, his heart's still racing from the scream he's just had. And he's trying to think like that felt really real and he's like feeling his eyes. And he can't believe that that was a dream. That was the most vivid dream he's ever had in his life. And so eventually he goes back to sleep. And then the next morning when he gets up, he goes in the bathroom and he looks at his eyes and they're all red around the outside and the whites of his eyes are covered in blood. His eyes look horrible. Like he's having this terrible allergic reaction to something or it looks like someone might've punched him in the eyes or maybe gouged his eyes. That's how it looks. And his wife comes in and she's like, what happened to you? And he's like, oh my God, I have no idea. It was around this time that Jason began to think the Dybbuk box might just be cursed because the two previous owners have said in their disclosures on eBay that horrible, vivid dreams, just like the one he had to include physical manifestations are part of having this Dybbuk box. Jason considered just dumping this thing in a dumpster somewhere, but then he was concerned that he might be passing on this Dybbuk box to someone who wasn't ready for it. And so he decided he would give it another day and he would do some research about how to properly dispose of a Dybbuk box. And so 
Oh, none of y'all was ready for it. <laughs> they thought they was. None because they like into like antique things and then like the college kids was like into like the hunting None things. of y'all are ready um, for Like what? ghost-like things or whatever the case Nobody's be. ready for nothing that they no. ain't never experienced before. No. Like, like you like, might set your mind like. Especially look. when you dealing with stuff like, like you know, this, like this. Baby. Like you are never like. Baby. Because my whole thought process this whole time was, mm-hmm. why y'all can't just throw it in the trash? Why y'all can't I, take it to a landfill and See, I it? never thought of that because I'm but like... Because it, it's, yeah. it might be... You, it's a proper way you have to dispose, dispose of, of it. Dispose of it because... Because you just can't burn it. Because then it might just be attached to you, the person who lit the fire. So you... So now I'm ready to figure find out like how to dispose if possible. This is crazy, bro. He would give it another day and he would do some research about how to properly dispose of a Dybbuk box. And so that night when Jason came back from work, he left the Dybbuk box in his truck covered up in his driveway. And so Jason goes inside, he has dinner with his family, and then he's sitting down in the TV room and he's watching TV with his son. And as they're watching TV quietly, Jason hears his son say, hey dad, who is that? And he looks over at his son and his son is pointing behind him. And Jason turns around and standing right behind him is the same woman who had come in his room with a shawl on that gouged his eyes out in his dream. And then she suddenly disappears. And Jason's looking at his son like, you just saw that too? And he's like, yeah, who was that? And so Jason grabs his son. He yells for his wife and says, we have to leave the house right now. His wife comes downstairs and she's like, what's going on? And he was like, I will explain in the car and we have to take your car. And so his wife sees how serious Jason is and she says, okay. And they get into her car and they drive down the road and that's when Jason explains what's going on with the Dybbuk box and how he and his son just saw the same woman that he had seen in his dream the night before that gouged his eyes and his eyes were red and his wife's starting to get really scared and his son's really scared of what's going on and so the solution they came up with was they were going to drive back to their house drop Jason off who was going to get in his truck where the Dybbuk box is still in the back it's still locked in the back of the truck and he's going to drive it a few miles outside of town to a rental property they owned that no one was staying in and he was going to put it in the basement and it was going to stay there until they figured out how to dispose of it because they didn't like the idea of just dumping it somewhere because they felt like if this is real and it's actually this cursed Dybbuk box then somebody else is going to be cursed by this Dybbuk box unless we find a way or at least attempt to find a way to contain it and destroy it. And so Jason gets dropped off, he gets in his truck, he drives to the rental property, he puts it in the basement, he seals it up, and he goes back to his house. Once Jason got back to his house, his wife and his son came back as well. And that night, Jason would go on eBay and he would find the contact information for Kevin, the original owner of the Dybbuk box after the estate sale. And he called him that night and Kevin actually picked up and the two of them spoke and Kevin ultimately agrees to help Jason find a way to properly dispose okay of this Dybbuk box. Don't call me. I got <laughs> rid of it. I got rid of it. Bruh, I'm like, Why are you calling me? Call the people you got it from. You ain't get it from me. No, nah, don't call me because I told you, but not to open it. I told you, me, Ma said don't <laughs> open that box and that's what she meant. And we asked no, no, questions. No, 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 no. I'm talking about don't call Kevin. Call the little frat boy. Well, the, oh, who he got it, it from? Yeah, call oh. the folks you got it from. They in Missouri. I'm <laughs> no, all the way in Oregon. Now he's like, no, nah, I'm about to call the original ones, the ones that opened this box. I don't know nothing. Call the call. You the knew not to you. open it. You knew not to open it, and you did because you, you're curious. I'm curious. No. <laughs> no. Let's go. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Kevin offers to do is drive back to the house where he had originally purchased this Dybbuk box and see if he can get some more information about what it is and what they do with it. The next day, Kevin, the antique shop owner, he goes back to the house where he originally bought the Dybbuk box at the estate sale. He knocks on the door and an old woman comes to the door and Kevin introduces himself and he says, hey, you know, I was here not too long ago and I purchased lot 29 that included that Dybbuk box and I wanted to know some more information about it. And the woman reacted and she's like, you know, I told my family not to sell that. I know what was inside of it and I know you're not supposed to open it. And I tried to tell my family and they didn't listen. I really hope you didn't open it. And Kevin's like, 
actually, yeah, I did open it. And he described all the horrible things that happened and he described selling it and all the subsequent owners, how they've had all these issues and how they've arrived at this place now where Jason in Missouri is having all these issues and they're trying to find a way to dispose of it. And that's when Sophie describes what's actually inside of this box. Sophie said she lived in Poland before World War II with her cousin Havila, who was the woman who had passed away and all her things were being sold at the estate sale. And she said that at the time, it was all the rage to have seances and try to talk to dead people and spirits, and they would just do it for fun. Sophie, Havla, and their mother, they would just, they would do this for fun. And Havla had made this Ouija board where she'd stitched letters onto this blanket and they put it over this table and they would all hold this pendant that was suspended by a chain and they would ask questions and they would hope that, you know, a spirit that they were interacting with would interact with this chain and it would swivel around the pendant and it would point to the different letters whenever they asked a question and it would spell out, you know, whatever their answer was. And Sophie said, nothing ever happened. It was just kind of a fun thing for them to do. But one time it did work and they said the chain would go rigid and it would point over and over and it would spell the words, release me, release me, release me. Sophie said the women were incredulous and didn't believe it at first, but then they started to worry that if they didn't help this thing, that if it were a Dybbuk and were a malevolent spirit, they would find a way to attach itself to one of them. And so Sophie said they devised this ritual where they released it, but into this wine box that they were able to shut and lock. And that wine box became the Dybbuk box and then Dybbuk box is the same one that was sold to Kevin. Kevin told Sophie that, what do we do? We've already opened it up. And she said, you need to contact a rabbi. And so they would call a rabbi and apparently they were able to reclaim the Dybbuk inside of the box and lock it and put it away in a secret location where it's been since 2003. And apparently since it's been sealed off, Jason and Kevin have said they've experienced no demonic activity and they never plan to tell anybody where this thing is because they don't want anyone else to have even the opportunity to reopen the Dybbuk box and have to deal with all the horrible things that they went through. So that's gonna do it guys. I hope you enjoyed today's story. If you found the secret. What if somebody purchases, like wherever y'all got it, uh, y'all don't like disclose. Like someone like come across it like, like years if, if, later if, What if something? it's in a house and somebody purchases a house, then y'all forgot, hmm, eh. Hmm. I don't but, know. Yeah, I feel what you're saying. But or... I, I get why you don't tell because you don't tell because you got weird weird people who go. I want to experience it. I yeah, want to see if it's real or not. I want. Yeah. So you like well, we we're, we're not gonna want to tell anyone where is that, where is located, what like you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you want to keep it a secret, but eventually you have to tell someone. I mean, do you? Yeah, because eventually you might pass away. Somebody needs to know. Okay, and then what if they don't tell nobody and they pass away? And it's just like, you know what I'm saying? They're like, well, they told me not to say anything, so I'm because not going to say anything what I'm saying is, happened to be. Eventually, somebody might find it yeah, and, that's be why like, I know. and be like, oh, what is Curious this? Curious, too, who want to know and open it and up. They and they don't know, and they don't even know it's a divot box. They just see this. They just see, and then all this, these things happen, and they and don't that's know. Why I'm like, you have to eventually tell somebody. Yeah, to, I would think that, too. Or but, give it to a rabbi. Keep it at a church somewhere. Don't just... Well, we don't know where it's at. It may be. We right, don't know exactly right. where it's at. But th I thought about that. I'm like, well, dang, what if like years later? Because you never know, like things happen and people find like these weird things in like weird places and they open it up not knowing that that's what it is and these things are happening, but they're not associating it to that because they don't know that that's what it is. See you know what and, I'm saying? Because you know, like, the reason why I said like homes and stuff, because you know, people keep crazy things inside of home yeah. and then they forget that it's even in there and they sell the home. Yeah. That's one reason why I, was, I used to always be like, I never buy an old house because you never know what's inside of those. But I wonder, could you just like bury it like in the middle of nowhere? As well, as it's, it's trapped open. now. Yeah, as long as it's not open. But then somebody going to dig it up or somebody can place something on top of it. But that's what I'm saying. If you place something on top of it, as long as it's not open and you don't like release yeah, it right, out, like, right, should right. it be fine? Yeah. I don't know, child. But... I had too many questions going on through my head to even like wrap, like, even know, wrap but... the information up to even like, because this was, this was what's the, the biggest like anxiety one we've seen. You know what question I got with all the, like the... The bugs and stuff that were like in the college kids, like mm -hmm. was that like for real? 
Because, you know, he said it was, it was like hallucination. So, but was it really bugs? For real, for real? Or did the bugs like go away when the box went away? But I wonder why old girl left the shop. And when he came to her, she was just stunned. Like she, like did it take, take over her body for no, a while? No, I didn't. I don't know. I think she was just kind of in shock and it was just a lot going on. She but she was like seated to, to the point where she's, it's kind of like she just gave up. Like you just, like you just been screaming, screaming, screaming. Look, I'm in defeat. You just, you just like this, like. I'm in defeat at this point. I can't like, get out of here. Like you know whatever what it is, if you want me, bro, like. I, I don't know, but. I can't um, even fight no more. But yeah, I would have, Jane, I would have left I would, too. And I, I would have said F you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you, but, uh, you ain't got to believe me, but F you, I'm good. And you ain't spoke to her since. Because she feels, though, that place cursed. Yeah. She like, I ain't even finna go full with this fool. Because he said that he regretted it in an interview later on because he must have had an interview. I wonder, has he apologized to her or have they spoke since? I wonder, can you even find this guy? What's that, Kevin? Kevin. How you spell Dibbit? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, I think, or something. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Because I just... Like it's it's the craziest things that I just be like. You know what? You got a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> so you curious like Kevin, huh? Nah, nah, I ain't I ain't on that type of <laughs> curious level. Yeah, I told you you can Yeah, you. D Y B B U K. I mean, U X. Was that the X or K? Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna wait a bit. I'm just trying to see what he might look like, you know? Uh, so this might be him? Yeah. Oh, I spell so it. It's, it's, it may yeah. be, yeah. Is it D-Y or D-I? I don't know. Either way, it's all pronounced the same. So this but. is the Kevin guy. Yeah. Yep, that's him. But um, I, I think. You got two more mother. Y'all are so. Open it. It's another one. See, okay, so see, y'all be, be playing much. with sh that y'all ain't got no I think because a lot of people in their head, they, 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 no, a lot of people in their head, they make themselves believe, like, it's it's not real. Like, it, well, ain't nothing gonna happen. We just mm. gonna do it for fun. Mm. Nothing will happen. Whatever case, because a lot of people don't believe in stuff like that. So, it's just kind of like, whatever. But. Man, I'll be pushing y'all luck, bro. <laughs> I'm cool. I'm cool where I'm at. Yeah. I don't know. Hey, yeah. man. Y'all spam us up in the Please comments. Do. <laughs> Let us know y'all thoughts and opinions, man. Honestly, that, we ain't pause as much because this one, just like, you just got to take take the information. And I was trying in. to get to it. I was yeah. like, I need to know what's going on. There's a lot of build up. <laughs> yeah. But, but as always, man, y'all know how it go. I do go with the name DJ Mickey to see it. See you on the post. Yeah, yeah. Get it, ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my folks. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't declare me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long, get my team strong. Let me run away from my problems.